Welcome to uh, the New Age Christian Village Church, and, and we're doing another one of our uh, peaks at an astrological uh, sign, and this one is Virgo, for those of you who were born under the influences of that. Uh, what I like to do, and especially when we have some new people here and new people out along the line, is try to set up, before we go into the characteristics of the sign, um, a reason that I have or an authority that I have to do this. I don't think it's fitting for me who's not a student of astrology per se, and yet who happens to be a student of biblical things and ancient religions, I think that I have an obligation to say on what basis uh, do I find uh, authority to even speak about these things and connect them to the Bible. You know? I mean, it's one thing for me to give my opinion or for you to give your opinion, and I don't usually dwell or work that way. I, I like uh, each person to be able to see the authority of which you know, we speak. So in other words, when we look at astrology per se and we look at the science of the stars and the cosmos, where is the authority in the Bible for me as a Christian, would you say, uh, to even talk about this stuff? When I say Christian, I use the word Christian as Christ consciousness, Krishna, Buddha, whatever, call it whatever you want. But in the West, we're oriented towards this way. In the West, we're oriented to the Bible, and that's what I've been given to do. I, I was telling folks this morning, you know, I cannot make Buddhists out of, East, out of Western people. And I don't try, and I don't think it's fair to try. People are, are Westernized. We've been raised under the Judeo-Christian concepts. We've been rooted into the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And to just all of a sudden think we can take people into a Sri Lanka atmosphere and create, the, you know, the bells and all of these things, maybe for certain groups, but for the masses of people, you have to touch them where they're at. You have to be able to prove the New Age. You have to be able to prove that divine consciousness, the divine mind is God, but you've got to be able to prove it in the context of where people are and they're Western-oriented people. I was given a, a great uh, thought when I was in Florida the last time and I was thinking of that and I looked at a palm tree under which I was sitting and writing and I said to the palm tree, I understand now, if I took you up to New Jersey, you would die. In other words, where are your roots? That's where you're going to be comfortable. That's where you're going to be fed. So it's my job to be able to come in this new age of Aquarius and show people who are comfortable with the Bible, who are comfortable with the Western approach, the proof of what I say. First of all, so if you have one of these Bibles, and I hope that you do because, um, you know, they're laying around here, let me show you so that you can see with your own eyes what I'm talking about. And if anybody doesn't have one, if you'd like one, you can just raise your hand and Ethel will get you one. But it's interesting for you to see, not or hear from my lips, but actually see, okay? All right, there's a, a few folks that want one, so I'll give you a chance to get it because it's important that you, that you see this, all right? How many, do, how many do we need? Just raise your hand, okay. All right, there's one, there's two. Okay, that's fine, there's, now everybody's got one. All right, now here's the, <laughs> Here's the hard part, since we started a little late, I'm going to get you to open up to a, a you know, page, and I want you to open up to page one, all right? And don't worry about the, 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 the looking for the verses and the chapters and all of that business. Just, just look at the top of the page and go to the page that I, that I tell you to go to, and you'll see what you have to see. If you look on page one, which is the book of Genesis, now go to verse 14 on page one. And it says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven of the days. Talking about the stars, and let them be for signs. Right, signs. Now, the Bible says the stars, among other things, are for signs. And I then reach the conclusion, if God, whomever it or he or she is, has created these things for signs, then we have a responsibility to find out what the signs mean. And not to try to find out what the signs mean would be an abandonment of the creation and God himself. So that's one thing, signs. So we want to find out what the signs mean. The second thing, that if you go to page 539 in those little Bibles that you have, page 539, you wind up at Psalm 147. Psalm 147. And the second thing that we find, in addition to the fact that these stars are for signs, in Psalm 147, verse 4, it says, he tells the number of the stars and he calls them by their names. Isn't that interesting? So now we have in the Bible the fact that the stars are for signs and they have been given names by the divine creator. Therefore, we have an obligation to find out what the signs mean and why are they called what they're called. 
Okay, fine. Signs and names. But here's the question that I think a lot of folks and a lot of Christian people would have trouble with. Do they influence you? Do these things have an influence over you? Do they influence the consciousness of man? And if so, can that be proved in the Bible? Ooh, let's see. Let's go to page 459, all right? And if you go to page 459, it takes you to a very ancient document called the Book of Job, J-O-B. And if you look at the Book of Job, you come to Job chapter 38 on page 459. In Job chapter 38, go to verse 31. And what does it say? Can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? Aha! The Pleiades exerts a sweet influence over people. That's what the Bible says. Or can you loose the bands of Orion? Do you see that word there in the next verse? Can you bring forth Maseroth, M-A-Z-Z-A-R-O-T-H? You know what Maseroth means? The 12 signs of the zodiac. So what we have seen, we've seen in the book of Job, that the stars, these constellations, have an influence, a sweet influence, a banding influence over the minds of people, that God gave them their names, that God made them for signs. And so then we start to develop an authority. We start to develop a justification to look at this thing maturely. And they're not to be like Christians, oh, I'm not allowed to look at this, you know. Why aren't you? Because uh, my pastor said so. Well, get, get, get away from them then. Get away from them. Because here we have men, women, who are influencing other, pe influencing other people to be frightened away from what? From, from the things that are created by God and by nature. Now we come to the point where we are living today, and that is the age of Aquarius, the man with the pitcher of water. So we look for a prophecy about the man with the pitcher of water. The disciples asked Jesus Christ in this little myth, what shall we know? How shall we know? Where shall we have our supper with you? Where shall we meet with you? And there's a strange prophecy that is uttered that is about where we live today. This is about the age that we're in today. Look at page 859. Page 859 in the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 22, Verse 10, and Jesus says, when you enter into the city, which means consciousness, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Jesus is prophesying of the age of Aquarius. How do I know he's not talking about a man carrying a pitcher of water down Main Street in Jerusalem? Because in those days and in that part of the country, a man would not be caught dead carrying a pitcher of water. That was women's work. They wouldn't carry a pitcher of water. So here's a prophecy of the age of Aquarius that Christianity knows nothing about. When you see, when you come to understand the age of Aquarius, which you're living in right now, go into the house, which is yourself, go to the upper room, which is your higher consciousness, and there you will meet the Christ. That's quite a prophecy. Jesus knew astrology beyond the point of Aquarius. We know of the lunar uh, uh, zodiac, which is the mansions. We know of the solar zodiac, which is the house. And what does Jesus say? In John chapter 14, look at page 880. You're not that far away from it. John chapter 14, page 880. John chapter 14 and verse 2. In my Father's are many mansions. He's talking about the universe. He's talking about the things that the people who follow him and put bumper stickers on and say, Jesus is this, Jesus is that, scare the hell out of them. But Jesus says, in my Father's house, or many mansions. He's talking of the Zodiac, and he says, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, I mean, you, you, you may have some hints, I would think, that he's talking in astrological terms. There's an interesting thing. And every time I do this, and I like to do it before we do a lesson on an astrological sign as we're doing tonight, because after all, you know, you, you, you should have some, some credibility. But there's, and I can never draw a picture of a bear. That's the, no, that's, the, that's a big tail. That would be a tail that's too, it looks like a tail like that. And the bear, oh my. This is a little better bear than I've done before, though. Oh, ear, would that be an ear for a bear? <laughs> looks like a happy, rhinoceros, yeah, that's a rhinoceros. But that, anyhow, forget it. Here, uh, here's how you know it's a bear. Uh, it's a bear. Now, the reason I show you that is because there's a mighty constellation in the universe called Ursa Major. All right? Ursa Major. And what I'm going to show you in Ursa Major is that the Bible is written in the stars before it was ever written in the book. 
in the right rear paw of that Ursa Major is a star called the Daughter of the Assembly. All right? The right front paw is a star called Talitha. Talitha. Now, that's, it, and that's not necessarily interesting of itself, but when you get into the Bible, and this is why I wanted you to have one so you could see for yourself. Go to page 814. You're in Mark chapter 5, page 814. Okay? And there in Mark chapter 5, on page 814, it says, Behold, there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Now, a ruler of the synagogue at that time, the synagogue was also known as the assembly. And what does the ruler of the assembly say? Verse 23, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Here we have the star in the right rear paw of Ursa Major, the daughter of the assembly. Okay? Oh, wow, well, you're reaching for that. I mean, you know, what the heck? You know, the daughter of God is going to go, I can't prove What the heck? Is this guy making up this stuff. Go to verse 41 in that same chapter. And Jesus goes into the house, and he took the damsel by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kumi, Talitha arise. Talitha arise. The daughter of the assembly, Talitha. And a guy came up to me last night, and his name was Lenny Rosenblum in New York. Lenny Rosenblum is one of our great supporters. He is as Jewish as you can get, and he, he just, he's, he's, he's a great guy. He looks, the way, he looks just like you'd hear Lenny Rosenblum from New York. He comes up, he says, listen, I need to talk about this. What? What is this here with the assembly? I don't know from Talitha. What, what is it? I know it's in the stars, but what are you saying here? I don't, tell me what this means. You see, and what, what happens here is you look into the, you look into the, into the, into the deep mysticism of this. What is the daughter of the assembly? Okay. The assembly's religion. And the daughter is the offspring of the desires, the desires that come from religious training, the desires that come from the lower mind. The daughter oh, is the feminine principle of the emotions. It is the desires of the emotions. And my emotional nature and my desires that have come from my emotions have just about destroyed me. And so Jesus comes and acts out this myth in the stars and says, Talitha, which is the name of the daughter, rise, bring your daughter upward. Lift yourself out of the morass of the lower mind. Raise yourself up into the, into the, into the realms of nirvanic consciousness where you will be free of all of this, which is religion and all of the rules and regulations of the system. Talitha, Talitha, Kumi. It's interesting because you, you don't, as I said to the folks last night, you can go to a planetarium or you can go to a sanitarium. You go to the sanitarium, you follow religion. You can go to the planetarium and follow the Bible. And you can see the daughters of the assembly in that right rear paw, and you can see Talitha, and then you can open the Bible, and voila, there it is. Quickly, the um, author in the Bible, the apostle Paul, there's, there's a star cluster, two stars in the constellation Gemini called Castor and Pollux. Okay? Castor and Pollux are in Gemini. And I seem to think that the Bible is revealing to us the astrological sign under which the Apostle Paul was born. I'll show you why. Page 918. 918 in your little Bibles, in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, chapter 28. And verse 11, here's Paul saying, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Whose sign was Castor and Pollux. That's astrology in the Bible. How dare they? My God, we'll have to rip that out before Billy Graham sees it. Can't be tolerated. The fact is, it's in the Bible. All of these things which people think, oh, I've got to go get a book by Swami Wami and all of this stuff. No, you don't have to. Everything is here because it's all the same. Jesus, Buddha, the Krishna are one and the same person, making one and the same step. And so now we come to the very last one, and then we're going to divergle, and that is the influences. What can the, what can the stars do? Can the star, remember when Ronald Reagan was having trouble? I, I wouldn't go out to a meeting, you know, ah, because uh, what was her name? Pat said, you know, the astrologist, don't go to the meeting. Was that her name? Huh? Nancy? Nancy Reagan. Oh, well, she was into astrology, and, and, and Ronald wouldn't go, and all of this stuff. And I was, oh, this is crazy. And of course, Christians were appalled by this. There was a guy named Sisera. 
And Cicero was a warrior, and he wasn't doing too well. In fact, he was running like blazes, and the other guys with the spears and everything, they were on Cicero's back. So one day, Cicero was staggering down. He was, oh, oh, no, in the desert, where do I go? And here, he, uh, the, the flap of the tent opens, and there's this little thing, you know, this little sweet thing. And she said, come on, sis. And he said, whoo-wee. Okay, mama, here I come. And so Cicero goes in. She gives him a little milk. And Cicero lies on the floor and falls asleep exhausted. And this pure little thing picks up a tent peg. You know what a tent peg is? <laughs> Takes it and rams it through Cicero's head and nails his head to the floor. This is the Bible, you know. Make sure your children read this in Sunday school. And as uh, Cicero dies with uh, his head being pinned to the ground by, once again, understand it, you know, the, the parable, the allegory of it that which is the emotions entices you into the camp and then places you in bondage to the earth or that which is the lower mind, okay? But the point is this. Watch now about how this guy got in trouble. Watch very carefully and think about astrology. Think about Reagan. Think about a lot of things. Go to page 215. 215. And on page 215, look at the, the book of Judges. Okay? And then will you be on Judges chapter 5? Judges chapter 5. And poor old Cicero, what happened to him? Look what it says as to what happened to poor old Cicero. Judges chapter 5, verse 20. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Cicero. In other words, <laughs> you just looked at a biblical horoscope, which said Cicero should have stayed home. OK? So there we've looked at things that I think give us a relative right to look at astrology as a scientific basis and consider it as its influence upon you and family members. And maybe we get to know each other a little better. Virgo. Now. There are a lot of negative things. A couple of weeks ago, I did my sign, a lot of negative things. A couple of weeks ago, we did Albert's, a lot of negative things. Last week, we did Ethel's, a lot of negative things. But remember that you can rise above the negative. You can rise above the negative by your meditation. So understand this and realize that there's a duality. But Virgo, for those of you who are born under the sign here and on television, expresses the idea of virginal purity, which is Christ. Remember, we're looking at this Christ-centered. We look at all things Christ-centered. I'm not here to meditate so I can float around the room. I'm not here to meditate so that I can have some kind of an experience. I'm here to meditate so that I can find Christ consciousness. And the reason I want to find Christ consciousness is so that I can be of help to you, and you can be of help to others, and we can help the children, and we can help the animals, and we can help the earth, and we can help the world. That's the purpose of meditation. But Virgo holds the wheat in her hand. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. The Christ, of course, is called the bread of life. But Virgo, oh, I'm just going to try to draw a picture of it, and I, and I can't do that. But she holds a shaft of wheat in her hand. She, she's actually the virgin's holding the, the shaft of wheat, the bread of life. And of course, the virgin is none other than the virgin consciousness. It's not a woman. It's not a person. It's the virgin consciousness. When you separate your mind from thought, your consciousness is virgin, and then you can give birth to the Christ child within who is the bread of life, who will feed you wisdom and understanding. Virgo is the beginning of all things. Okay? Starts in September, Virgo, and there the, the sun, after it reaches its zenith in August in Leo, it begins then life over again. It must go back into the womb of the virgin and be born again because it has a rendezvous with the cross on December the 21st. It is to be born anew after the three days and three nights in the tomb of the winter solstice on December the 25th, and then 30 days after the birth of the sun in December the 25th, it goes into the water man Aquarius says 30 years after the birth of Jesus in that story, he goes into the waters of John the Baptist. It's all astrology. It's all astrology. It's all astronomical. Out of the virgin womb comes the Christ and she holds the wheat to fulfill the universal word. And then we have John 6.33 which says, for the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. But the point is, folks, Heaven is within you. There is no heaven anywhere but inside of you. 
He who comes down from heaven is the renewed mind that comes from within you. Once it comes down and gives new life to the world, which is your being, then you radiate that which is heaven, and you start to send the vibrations out. And as millions of people do all over the universe, the planet Earth is changed into the planet heaven. Coming down from the virgin mind is all that sustains us and makes us strong. Virgo is renewed and cleansing, and that the, the child must be brought forth. It's interesting that the sixth sign is the pure virgin, Virgo, and the sixth beatitude is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is pure in heart? You know, who can be pure in heart? Who can be pure in heart? First of all, don't think of the pump in your chest. That's not the heart. You know, which, that's where you see a lot of religious people. I've got God right here in my heart. Well, then you got indigestion. That's what I get. I get indigestion because I'm uh, pure of heart. Having God in your heart means in the center, the center of the mind, the center of consciousness. And what Jesus is saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, is when your consciousness is pure, when you have purged away all the thoughts of the mind, then in the center of that consciousness, there you will see God, which is with the single eye, that which is the beauty of the universe. So a, a Virgo person is fine when ruled through the feminine principle of the divine concept of Virgo, but, but when the matter rules the brain, then Virgo can be very much clogged with junk. Such a person lives wholly in the physical, and the unfortunate part with Virgo is it becomes definitely heavily self-conscious, healthy ego. Gemini asks several questions at once. That's, that's Gemini. What about this? What about that? Virgo is one way. One single question at a time. And Virgo, now think about this. You might think of this in your previous or your... Virgo is extremely critical. Virgo is always analyzing. Virgo takes in only specific ideas. It's never open to anything but what it wants. It wants it to come out this way and it won't allow it to come out any other way. Virgo is a negative mercury sign. It's not so much creative as constructive. It's method methodical, very orderly, very efficient. They make very good planners, very good designers, Virgo people. And they're much concerned with detail. They concentrate on the parts, but, but then sometimes they lose sight of the whole because they can become irritatingly fastidious. Every little point, every little thing, you got to dot every I, every little thing has got to come out exactly right. That's Virgo. And the Virgo mind is very fast working, but very narrow grooved, you know? Narrow minded, I guess, would be the way to put it. They always want to know why. Everything has got to be why. But, you know, why can be very helpful, you know? If, if you ever get into psychology and you ever talk to a psychologist, he'll say, whenever you got a problem you can't deal with, ask why. Why do you feel this way? Because this happened. Why did it happen? Because so-and-so said this. Why did so-and-so say that? Because I, uh, I got mad at her. Why did you get mad at her? Because she didn't show up at time. Why didn't she show up on time? And, and you, can, you can bring the whys and whys and whys back to a root. It's a very interesting principle that psychologists use, and it's called the why principle. And sometimes if you really have a serious problem that's nagging you, do that. Just put on a piece of paper, why? And, and sometimes you come up with a strange reason. But that's what Virgo does, very analytical. Why, 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 why? Who does Virgo relate to in the Bible? Thomas. Why? They doubt. They doubt. Virgo relates to the doubting Thomas of the Bible. Because what happens to Virgo, not only do they sit in judgment about other people, they sit in judgment upon themselves. They sit in judgment about everyone else. And Virgo, if you were to look in the ancients, Virgo is known as the sign of judgment. Judgment. I'm going to check you out, analyze you, figure you out, and reach a conclusion. And so Virgo, if you're a Virgo, you've got to rise against this tendency. You've got to meditate. You've got to rise against this tendency because your tendency is to be very cynical. Your tendency is to be very worldly wise. And your tendency, according to the ancients with Virgo, is to be the master of destructive criticism. Easily resolved by meditation. Finding fault, splitting hairs. Because finding fault and splitting hairs can repel 
more than it reveals because there's always pain. You always find Virgo people a lot of pain and a lot of anguish, much mental strife, because what they're trying to do is manifest in their personality that which is really concealed deep within them. Because of their inferiority complex, and most Virgo people have an inferiority complex, so strong in Virgo make their lives misery by dwelling on morbid and false thoughts. Dwelling on morbid and false thoughts. I mean, you know, we're all, we all have, we all do that. But that's, that's, in other words, that's a tendency more with the Virgo person. You know, it's always, my God, you know, you know, we create these things that aren't there, and we actually live them, you know? Actually, actually experience the hurt as if something terrible had happened. I remember somebody was talking about, um, a, 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 a somebody got on an airplane. A mother said goodbye to her son. Son got on this particular plane. The plane crashed. And she heard the plane had crashed, knew her son was on it, everybody was wiped out, and she just went into a terrible collapse and became sick. And she never knew that her son missed the plane. It didn't make any difference that he wasn't dead. One, when she went into the collapse and had to be rushed to the hospital, he was in a diner. He didn't know that the plane had crashed. So he was just having something to eat, and he was going to call his mom and tell her he was going to catch a later plane. He didn't know. She heard the plane was crashed and everybody was killed, and they took her to the hospital, and she had a heart attack and all of this stuff. So it didn't, the reality of what really was happening had nothing to do with what she thought was happening. Huh? He wasn't dead. He wasn't on the plane. He was having lasagna somewhere. And they were rushing her in an ambulance to the hospital because of what she thought happened. So the morbid thought doesn't require a reality connected to it. The thought itself can kill you. And that's why Jesus says, take no thought. Now, I'm the worst one like that. I'll never forget I was in Baltimore. And I keep tracks on. I, I do. I keep track on Joan. I put a leash on her because, you know, you never know. She was down at, I had to go to a meeting, so she stayed at a different hotel with Kathy. And I called down there, and they weren't there. About 8 o'clock, I was done with my meetings. There was no, no answer. I called at 9 o'clock, there was no answer. This is Baltimore. You know? 9.30, I called, there's no answer. 10, I called, there's no answer. Now, 11, you know, you, you start to get sweaty, and you start to think. In this town, they had a strange town. They could have been attacked. They could have been mugged. They could be dead. Somebody could have broke into the... And that's it. Now your mind is starting to carve you up in pieces. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm calling... You know what I did? I called the security in the hotel, and I told the guy, if you had to kick the door in, something's wrong. It was midnight. There was no, nobody there. I knew they wouldn't be out at midnight. The security man went up, and here they came walking. They were out at some restaurant. They come walking down the hall, and he's banging on the door. He says, that's our room. I said, well, your husband's uh, looking for you. <laughs> and she calls up, Billy! You know, the way. we were in the we're in that restaurant across the street. And I mean, but I didn't know that. And so I had to go through all of this. But it was just as if something morbid had happened. Uh huh. Just as if. So I'm not saying you can stop these things. But the tendency of the Virgo person is to dwell constantly in those things. And when you do, it causes problems in the body. It causes problems in the blood pressure. It causes problems in the cells and hormones and all that stuff. So they carry untruth within themselves. The Virgo person is prone to deceive themselves and badly misjudge other people. That's why important. You see how important meditation is? How important meditation is? It's not that they want to do it. That's a tendency because of the sign. And don't tell me. I mean, everybody says, you know, I've been one of the things crusading alone here. And you folks that have come here for a lot of months and a lot of years know this, that I have said, because of what I have been given through the cosmic teachings, that being homosexual is genetic and not a sin of any kind, you know. And of course, you get a lot of guff because the Jerry Falwells of the world, these people are all sinners and are all going to hell and all of this stuff. But lo and behold, we find in the newspaper 
that researchers have identified a gene pattern linked to male homosexuality, adding powerful new evidence to the scientific theory that the tendency to be gay can be inherited. Well, who didn't know that? It's obvious, you see. It's obvious. Well, who's to judge? Who's to say? It's just, oh, I don't like that lifestyle. Well, nobody's asking your permission to like the lifestyle. Nobody's business. So if it's a sin, whose sin is it? It's God's sin. Person's born. What does he know? What does she know? So then God shouldn't have made a thing where people, because it says that it's an X chromosome that comes from the mother. Hmm. What does Jesus say about eunuchs? You know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is a male who doesn't have all of the equipment that most males have. Jesus says some eunuchs are born that way from their mother's womb. So why shouldn't we know? Why should we be so surprised? <laughs> you know, it's so scientific. It's so stupid that we don't know. You know what Jesus says about the pineal gland, the single eye? He says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Very religious statement. The single eye is the pineal or the pineal gland of the brain. It secretes a hormone called melatonin. You know what melatonin does first? It's a skin lightener. Couldn't he have said, if you stimulate the pineal gland, your body will fill with melatonin. It's a skin lightener. He says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. It does a lot more than, than, than lighten. But this is, why don't we listen to this guy? You all got bumper stickers. They all go to church. Thousands of them are so-called getting saved, but they don't pay a bit of attention. Huh? So Jesus said 2,000 years ago, there's a lot of these people that you may think are gay or strange. They're born that way. But yet the same religion that hawks his name, oh, this is a sin. They're all going to hell. That's not what he says. Hmm. In Virgo, in marriage, the most important thing to the Virgo person is the purity of their partner. Because Virgo is very clean, very obsessed with personal hygiene. Keep yourself clean. Virgo in the sixth house rules health. Keith, health. <laughs> they maintain good health and they maintain youth, and, and, and they do so more if they meditate. I can't understand, you know, and I don't want to get frustrated, and, I, and, and I'm not going to get frustrated because it's none of my business, but I can't understand why people aren't doing that. I cannot understand when we come here on Tuesday nights or whenever why there are empty seats. I don't understand this. It's free. This is the most important universal scientific principle in, in, in the world to simply open up that right hemisphere of the brain. What the heck? could be so important that a half hour of entering into the very place where God dwells, we cannot have time. I'm busy. i got to be on the couch. What will the couch do without me laying there for a half hour? I mean, what can happen? Oh, the couch will be lonely. I can't do it. I can't. Uh, those in the lower aspects of Virgo, Virgo in the higher aspects is very clean. You know what those in the lower aspects of Virgo, Virgo are? Hypochondriacs. They got everything. You want to really kill them? Give them a physician's desk reference for a present. <laughs> I got a pain over here. If this is swollen, it means you got melanoma of the carcinoma branch of the right ventricle. Jeez, they got it, you know. Then they're up all night looking at it in the mirror, you know. But I got a pain on this side. If you have a pain in this side after you've eaten asparagus, it means that, you know, you're going to die in three days and all of this stuff, and I don't, you know. You got it. Don't give him a physician's death reference. <laughs> Virgo is ruled by, excuse me, Virgo rules the intestinal area for good or bad. Right. <laughs> a little remark. Yes. Some, some, you want to hear, see something, something very interesting? I, I, I'm going to show you something you may not have ever seen before. Go to the book of Psalms. And for those of you who have, I forgot to write this number down, the page number. Look at Psalm 7. What page is it on? So you can yell it out for everybody else to find. Psalm 7. Are you there? Page 465. Everybody go to page 465. I'm going to show you something very interesting. Okay? It's a little scientific, Albert. I like this scientific stuff because, as I said many times, if God is real, then God must be provable. If you can't prove it, forget about it. Psalm 7-9. This, this is neat. 
O oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tries the hearts and the reins. You know what the reins are? The reins are the intestines. That's what reins are. Really? What? God tries the hearts and the reins. Well, so would you say God tries the hearts and the intestines? That's what the word means. Look at, uh, somebody else yell out to me real quick. Proverbs 23, what page is that on? I didn't write that one down either, but that's okay. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Five what? 558, 559, okay. Look at Proverbs 23. And look at verse 16. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when your lips speak right things. My intestines shall rejoice. Can you hear them in the gospel song? I've got the joy, joy, joy deep in my intestines. Deep in my intestines. Yeah, yeah, that's what it says. We can do that one. I know you can. <laughs> what does it mean? It means something. What do the intestines do? Don't get too graphic. You know, don't, don't yell it out. You're going to, we ought to be a little bit reasonable in here. They get rid of everything that shouldn't be. Huh? They purge out that which is the waste. They cleanse so that only that which is to build up remains. That's why the reins are used in mythology. That's why the reins are used in the Bible. That's why it compares it to the intestines. Because it purges out, there will be a movement that will cast out that which does not belong within you. It will happen through your meditation. There are things that do not belong within you, and they must be moved, they must be purged out, and that's why the reins or the intestines are used as symbols. And Virgo people make very good nurses. They're very meticulous, very good healers, they act as barometers. They're very sensitive to mental, psychic, and atmospheric conditions. And they can sense a change. A lot of Virgo people, if you're Virgo people here, there's something interesting about a Virgo person. Remember we said about a Leo person, that a Leo person has the ability to telepathically send healing vibrations to other people at great distances. I don't know if that's true. That's what it says. You should try it. Maybe it's true. Tell me. But you know what it says about Virgo people? They can sense a change in the weather before it happens. So we don't need the, your weather on the computer. We just <laughs> listen and if somebody starts barking in the next room, we'll know that something's going on. Here's another thing about Virgo. They've got to be very careful about what they read before they go to sleep or they eat. Because it stays with them and they freak. There are people to listen to about the right foods and, and what foods contain, but Virgo must take their love of cleanliness to a higher degree, to a meditational degree. They must take their purity of the soul. That, that's where Virgo the virgin is fulfilled in the higher soul. Virgo is described in the Bible in the story of Mary and Martha. You want to take a look at that, and then we're just about ready to wrap this up, okay? Page 845, Luke chapter 10. Page 845, Luke chapter 10. And this is where Virgo is described. I, love, I always love this story. It says in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, as they went to a village, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet. But Martha was cumbered about which much serving and came to him and says, Don't you care that my sister doesn't help me? And Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part. Can you, figure, can you, under, can you see this? Can you, here's this guy over to visit. He is the local, you know, long hair guy, you know, new, really new age. You know, hey, tell me about this stuff, man. I'm going to this temple. I don't like that. What, what are you telling me about? Telling me about the inner kingdom and Aquarius, man. And the other woman, Martha's out there with the pots and pans. And I got the lasagna, and I got the cake, and this woman, and she comes over here, and she sits, and she doesn't help with nothing, sitting on the floor. You know, it gets me so mad. He comes over, and she's making a big fuss over him. 
and I got to be out here in the heat over a hot kitchen with all of this lasagna and all of the tomato sauce all over the place. And what the heck is she doing? And she goes out there and she says to Jesus, and I'm sure, you know, she, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, I got a lot of work to do out here. You want to, you know, you want to have dinner, and she wants to sit on her duff and listen to your stories about Aquarius and all of this stuff. Well, we got, don't you think it'd be nice if, if, if she got up, and you know what he said to her? You know, you're, you're sweating the small stuff. What are you sweating the small stuff? She, ch she chose the good part. She chose, she's chosen the right part. And see, see, that's what they do in religion. Oh, you got to do this. You got to get baptized. You got to get confirmed. You got to sign the card. You got to say, I'm saved. You got to invite this. You got to say, oh, oh. And Jesus said, ah, yeah, don't sweat the small stuff. Just sit, be quiet, and listen. That's all you got to do. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to help. All you got to do is sit and be changed. Right? The positive Virgo will then see that critical attitude that they have and transform it to the higher realms and find the right answers to universal questions. And Virgo, if you're willing to enter into meditation because of the sun, Virgo will bring psychic experience, but it's often confused with soul growth, and they're different. You can have a psychic experience, you know, through... Uh, uh, through, for booze or through drugs. That's not what this we're talking about. So a Virgo person has to be alerted to that. You might see things, you know, I had a great meditation the other night. I saw winged things in lights. Ever since people tell you, I saw lights. But then somebody had the light on. I mean, you saw a light, there's a light. What? Don't you understand that? And you can't get this through. The kingdom does not come with observation. You see, with the single eye, it's invisible. I, I, I thought the, the, the Bhagwan had a great story. The, the guy came and said, Bhagwan, I saw Jesus, and I saw this, and I saw that. And the Bhagwan said, you had too much pizza. It was the pizza. You saw nothing. Because if you see these things, you're using your mind. You rise up into that nirvana, like Mary Poppins above the mind, into nothingness. Because what's the purpose? The purpose of meditation is not that you can have a little joy ride. That's that, that's that Pentecostalism Christianity, which is like, the joy, 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 until they get home and they're all wretched and throwing stuff at one another. This is to lodge into the, into the, into the higher realms of the mind that which is there as a deposit in the bank to help you when trouble comes. And then when trouble comes, you can reach up and draw on what has been stored through your meditation and it will lift you over the crisis that happens in your life. That's what's so beautiful about it. Virgo is the, that sign. One is sensitivity to the astral world, and the other is a virgin consciousness that is pure with God. So Virgo must rise to the judgment seat of heaven. Individuals born in Virgo gain true satisfaction and will make advancement when they rise. It says, a second man must come to birth within the person of the earth. If man will live the life and love, he brings to birth the Lord above. Virgo. What do we do next? Next week, we'll do, what is that, July what, 25th? Libra. Okay, thank you very much. And Joan will come on.